I know you're all looking at me to see if I'm going to say it. <laughs> Uh, Joe's Joe's not privy to the uh, off-camera c- conversations that take place as he's joining us via the phone here. Joe Ferretti, good morning, Joe. How are you? Yeah, maybe I'm glad about that. <laughs> yes, you are. I'll wait, I'll wait here. I, well, I talking about you. it is the only funny part, and I'm pretty sure you're probably aware of he's what we're it. talking about. You he's, just don't know. He's living it, too. Talking. Alonzo's not, Colin's not, but they will someday. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, let's welcome back our uh, holdovers from the first half hour. The Admiral Bill Stubblefield on this Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day to you, William. Good morning. Thank you, Rob. Retired Good Admiral. Sure. Mr. John Gilstrap, New York Times bestselling author. Good morning. I'm not sure I've ever been a holdover before. But oh, you right. are now. All right. And uh, also, uh, happy Veterans Day to our next panelist, Alonzo Perry. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. You are quite welcome, sir. And to Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Good morning to you, sir. It's great to be here once again. It's great to have you back. We've yeah. missed you the last two weeks. Yeah, it's been... Uh, the Pull only two Michael weeks I've ever missed. Down and closer to you there. Is, right. is that right? I think so. You've made every other... I think so. Well, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. Well, uh, traditionally, we begin the uh, Friday program with uh, intros, and uh, I see no reason to break tradition today, so... And we go a little something like this. Hit it. Uh, Colin, we'll begin uh, first with Mr. Gilstrap. Uh-oh. You're uh, scoring along at home there. What do you do when you're done working for the year? You've written all your lines and the deadline is clear. You've killed all the bad guys and a few of your friends. You've completed eight steps and now you're making amends. Well, if you're John Gilstrap and you're the man who thinks, you show up on Friday and sit in your chair that sinks. (laughs) (laughs) It's an inside joke. (laughs) Some of the chairs lose their height as they go along during the course of the show. Um... Oh, Mr. Carl is not with us today, as he has his uh, partners meeting. So if Mike Carl is out, it must mean that Alonzo Perry is in. In between appearances here, I don't know where he's been. He travels with the treasurer on the Riley Moore beat. Is he going to law school next or running for a seat? He served his country, and while we await his next plan, on this Veterans Day holiday, let's all salute this man. That's very much very inspirational. Very inspirational. Larry, you're up next. Like Joe Manchin in a Senate race, Larry Schultz has been missing. And while he's been gone, there hasn't been as much Donald Trump dissing. <laughs> we'll get that fixed. <laughs> uh, I'm just here to hear Joe Ferretti laugh on the phone. By the way. Uh, but barring another wedding or function, Sir Lawrence is back. And judging by his topics, he's ready to go on the attack. In his law firm, Burke, Schultz, Harmon, and Jenkinson, he gets second billing. But to those loyal Trumpers, he's like a cavity in need of a filling. Morning, <laughs> It's great to be here. Sorry for the pain. Welcome, sir. Yeah. Are you? You're not really. No. <laughs> Are you? No, actually, it's the only measure we have. <laughs> uh, Joe, you're up next. I think. I think. <laughs> Uh, I think you got to have a sense of humor if you're an attorney. We'll test it right here. <clears throat> it was this <laughs> It was this date in history, November 10, 1989, if I recall, that those East and West Germans began to tear down the wall. Chunks of rock were chipped as the world watched in awe, but one man in particular was watching, a young attorney at law, who began typing out letters as the collapsing wall buried people alive. They read Frau. If you've been injured by falling rock, call 304 264 8505. <laughs> you need to stop there, Rob. You're on top of your game. Oh, that's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> Should I just end it there? I don't think so. You you can you cannot top that one. That was great. It sounds like there's something Bill's afraid you're going. No, to no, no. I, that was, <laughs> what, what is, Rob, Rob keeps telling us this is the week of the best introductions ever. Ever every week the same thing. Well, I think you 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 achieved it, today, Joe. <laughs> Joe, any comment on that? Well, the sad thing is that was so long ago, but I had already had three years of experience practicing law. That's how old I am. Wow. The statutes run on a lot of those claims. Right now. If you don't have them filed yet, just forget it. Oh, mercy. 
<laughs> that was a fun one to write. I got. I'm not going to lie. <clears throat> Uh, we've got a second veteran in the fold on this Veterans Day Eve, and when it comes to docking the ship, he's got a few tricks up his sleeve. <laughs> the Admiral has sailed around the world a couple times indeed, but it was romancing of Bonnie in which he showed his great speed. And while he achieved the top rank, it's not his own horn he will toot, because each morning when he begins his day, it is his wife he must salute. That's exactly right. We, we all agree with that. Yeah. Morning to you, Billy. Yes. Thank you, Rob. And remember, if you've been injured by falling rock, call three or four. <laughs> so we begin with issue number one, and for that we go to our leadoff hitter, Joseph Joey Torts Ferretti. Uh, Rob, you deserve a raise. Um, <laughs> all right, let's continue with our discussion about one Giuseppe Mancini, otherwise known as Senator Joe Manchin. I like that. Uh, there's there's a fellow that we have to recognize as one of the reasons why the senator announced he was not going to run for re-election. That fellow's name is Steve Gaines, who is the top aide to Senator McConnell. Mitch McConnell tasked Steve Gaines with the job of getting Joe Manchin out of the Senate. This was a two-year project, and it culminated in Steve Daines going to Donald Trump and convincing Trump that if he would endorse justice, Manchin would get out of the race, run as a third-party candidate, and siphon votes away from Joe Biden. That was the trick that Steve Daines pulled to eventually get the senator to decide, I'm not running for re-election. So that's a little bit of the palace intrigue behind this. But what does this mean for West Virginia? And that's really what I want to focus on. I think for the Senate seat itself, it probably hands it to uh, Governor Justice. He has a, a significant lead in the polls. He has the endorsement he coveted. He's got the money. So he's going to be very difficult to beat. For Democrats in West Virginia, as we heard in the prior seg segment, this is an end of an era. The last viable statewide candidate for uh, any uh, national office, at least, if not state office, has decided to exit stage left. For uh, Congressman Mooney, I think this is an indication that uh, somebody who is as skilled a politician as Joe Manchin has figured out that uh, while Congressman Mooney was the preferred candidate for Senator Manchin to run against, obviously Joe has decided that Mooney was not going to win that Republican primary. So I think that's a bad sign for Congressman Mooney. And lastly, for the state of West Virginia, the senior senator is now giving up his seat. And I think the ramifications of that are going to be very similar to what we felt with Senator Byrd, who you will recall Senator Manchin replaced when Senator Byrd passed away. The amount of federal funding coming to West Virginia is at an all-time high over $90 billion in federal funding in just the last four years. With kudos to Senator Manchin and Senator Shelley Moore Capito for being instrumental in getting us that money. We know West Virginia relies on federal funding, and you have to wonder if we send a governor to Washington, D.C., he will likely become the senator most likely to have his car repossessed. So we have to wonder, is he going to be effective as Senator Manchin and Senator Shelley Moore Capito have been, just like Senator Byrd before them? So I think the impacts on West Virginia are far and wide. Um, while a lot of Republicans celebrate this, I just wonder if those impacts on West Virginia are going to be so detrimental that we're going to miss old Joe. And I think we will. And I wonder what others think about that. I thought it was his helicopter that was getting repossessed, <laughs> not, not his well, car. <laughs> that too. <laughs> All right, so uh, we begin the survey around the room first with the uh, Welcome Back crew and Larry Schultz. Okay. Um, Jim Justice is um, a funny person. He's someone who amuses the voters by his mannerisms. He's like a friend you have when you live in West Virginia who's a hysterically funny guy, but when all your other friends from other states come to visit, you don't invite him home. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't mean he's not funny. The problem is I don't think it's going to sell too well. 
on the national scene. And should the numbers switch around so that suddenly, uh, God forbid, he was in the Joe Manchin seat of basically being the swing vote on big-time legislation, West Virginia's, uh, shall we say, popularity as a as a place to vacation and have a great time is going to take a hit because they're going to say, I can't believe the people of the state elected this guy to the United States Senate. He's not a serious person. He's not even a serious businessman. After all, most of the serious businessmen I know pay their bills, including their taxes, which run the government. This guy doesn't. I mean, there's a lot of pending litigation for him uh, regarding these huge business deals. That, of course, reminds us of somebody else who's on the national scene, whose who's litigation has moved uh, a little further than uh, Governor Justice is at. I do believe if he becomes a senator, the pace of that litigation will pick up. Um, I, I'm, I won't be surprised a bit if his name is in everyone's mouth the day after the election, that it will appear um, um, more important to move than it did. I mean, it only took the people in Manhattan 35 or 40 years to come after Trump. <laughs> and I think they'll shorten the timeline uh, on Mr. Justice. Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> Pennsylvania elected Frankenstein's monster, so I don't. <laughs> a, <laughs> um, so, but he, he has a Harvard degree. I mean, he's a bright guy. And I'm nobody's sh- saying Jim's all that bright. I, well, I don't. He, okay, here's I, the thing with Jim Justice and Baby Dog. I think he prints certainly to West Virginians, of uh, to this West Virginian. Prince as exactly what you say, a really affable guy, nice guy, one who deeply loves the state of West Virginia. And I don't know that we need that much more out of a senator in, in, in Washington. I think that, you know, the, losing the seniority is always a problem, but that's a wash. You know, with, with Manchin gone, it's whoever comes in is, is going to be the junior senator from West Virginia and, and low on the totem pole with the Senate overall. I think if if um, Jim Justice keeps West Virginia foremost in his mind and the politics of West Virginians foremost in his mind at the federal level, I think that's all we need out of him. I would be shocked if he has um, any aspirations to higher national office. Some have posited that he's doing this to distract attention from some of his legal problems, and that, and you know, God bless him. It's we have legal problems, but I think the love of Jim Justice, particularly in his response after the floods and all of that, um, I'm saying his name as often as he does. Uh, his his love for West Virginia and West Virginians' love for him make him the ideal senatorial candidate. I don't see a real downside. I don't see a huge upside, but I I think that he will tips the balance. Um, assuming everything else stays, uh, the status quo remains the same. He tips the balance of power um, and neuters the the Democrat administration, uh, which I, unfortunately I think will be another one. Um, so I, I think he's a net positive. And baby dog, come on. Alonzo. So I'm going to start by just saying that what's good for West Virginia is probably the country being good. And, and so when we try to like, I guess calculate the uh, this idea that we're losing political capital by losing Mansion. We have to understand that he's put this country in fiscal jeopardy with his support of the Inflation Production Act. Um, so I heard what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have to understand though that like uh, I'm I'm not completely sold that Jim Justice is going to win this race. Um, if anything, I think that Alex Mooney actually has a a real chance of beating Jim Justice and. Uh, I think that that's because most people understand that Jim Justice is going to vote just like Joe Manchin would vote. The only difference is that he's outside of the Democratic caucus. Um, so it, it's really – I actually agree with Larry that, that Jim Justice is – not capable of operating in a body of 100 and i think it would be bad for west virginia for jim justice to be there but 
uh, that's that's my synopsis of this. I, uh, it's a little bit of a different take on it. We have this captured on uh, digital storage technology at 852.15. Alonzo Perry stated, I agree with Larry Schultz. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Yeah, Stubblefield. Okay, <laughs> yeah. You two have been gone a while. There must have been some meeting while you guys were off there. Yeah. Uh, Joe started this by saying uh, Senator Daines uh, uh, taking credit for recruiting uh, Joe Ma- uh, uh, Jim Justice to run against Joe Manchin. Actually, uh, Mitch McConnell is taking even more credit. Mitch McConnell said that he's been working on this for the last two years. Of all the recruitments he's done in times past, he takes the greatest satisfaction in the recruitment of Jim Justice. Uh, I'll come back to the uh, point that we had with uh, with Ron Gregory earlier. It doesn't surprise me as much as the time of Joe Manchin's announcement, as much as the timing. Uh, Gregory also mentioned there are going to be a court case uh, the middle of this month that could be very damaging to Jim Justice. Uh, it's a court case that we have not been hearing or following much in the Eastern Pan now, but if Gregory's right, it could be very damaging, then that comes back even more to the question, why did Joe Manchin choose this as timing? He had nothing to gain if he's going to the unity party. That's, that, they're not give, even holding the deli, uh, their, uh, their meeting until sometime late January, early February. So he had a couple of so months there. If, the, if this court case does damage justice considerably, uh, then why did Manchin take his action at this point in time? Because most folks say, uh, of course, polls are wrong uh, a lot of the time, but most polls say that uh, Manchin could beat Mooney. They also say Manchin could not beat justice. So it all comes back to this question that I'm puzzling with, why the timing just now? That's a fair question. Joe, do you have a, a thought on that yourself? Well, I, I think I, I know a couple, uh, <laughs> the, the few remaining influential Democrats in the state of West Virginia uh, were concerned about having somebody on the ticket if Joe Manchin wasn't going to run. And there was some pressure that he announced sooner rather than later so the Democrats could get somebody up on the on the ballot, which which is not a big deal because we know it's going to be a Republican who wins that seat. Uh, and, and Mitch McConnell has already announced that they're not going to have to spend any money in West Virginia now because of uh, Joe Manchin's announcement. So uh, I don't know how big a deal that was, but I think the timing is also uh, Joe Manchin has not uh, cast aside this idea of a third party candidacy. And I think he wanted to get on the road and start testing the waters. I think there's significant hurdles to that, but I think he at least wanted to initiate that process. So while he has consistently said he wouldn't say anything until the end of the year, I think some of these uh, influences eventually got to him to the point where he figured he needed to make an announcement sooner rather than later. But uh, I I think the bottom line is uh, this is uh, a a tsunami for West Virginia in terms of the impact uh, of this announcement. And and I think uh, everybody has touched on some of those impacts. Uh, You can't cast aside the seniority issue in the U.S. Senate. Joe Manchin was a thorn in Mitch McConnell's side. There's no doubt about that because he was often the 51st vote. But on energy policy, Senator Manchin was very influential in representing the interests of West Virginia. He, I know, is excoriated for the Inflation Reduction Act, but, you know, that money is behind a lot of these economic development projects that are being announced in West Virginia. And we can't forget that, that all the politicians, Republicans and Democrats, show up to uh, turn the dirt with their shovels at the announcement of these projects and the federal money that's underlying all that, uh, and we forget that. Uh, when we think about uh, the impact of that particular piece of legislation. But overall, uh, I think the end of an era is here in terms of the Joe Manchin representing West Virginia. Uh, the question remains, is there representation beyond that that he seeks? Because I don't, he's not going to su- su- uh, surprisingly run for governor at the last minute here. That's not happening. So uh, it would just be interesting to see what he carves out for himself. 
Anybody else have a thought on the timing issue, Alonzo? You were shaking your head no before. Yeah, absolutely. I, so what's really interesting about this is that I think the timing is right on par with the Democrats realizing that Joe Biden is not their guy. I, I think that, you know, I, I have this theory that, you know, the DNC has proven time and time again that it is rigged to put whoever they want up there. And I think, you know, him exploring the country might be code for the Democrats need a new guy and who can the elites put their coat over to have run for president and push their agenda through. And Joe Manchin would be the perfect guy for them. And I think that, you know, uh, uh, looking at this, it, it might be a coin toss between Newsom and Joe Manchin. But the Democrats, I do not believe in good faith that they're actually going to run Joe Biden in 24. It, it's, it doesn't make sense. Larry? I... um almost speechless at this notion that Gavin Newsom so you are you the governor and, of California you and no longer agree on everything right. anymore <laughs> i think that's common <laughs> 6 minutes um, that lasted yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the idea that you can mention Gavin Newsom and Joe Manchin in the same breath as uh, potential presidential candidates is frankly ridiculous um Gavin Newsom has run a country that has more people in it than Canada. <laughs> Joe Manchin, for two terms, ran a state that has 1.7 million people, and it's losing people every day. So I, I don't see that as even remotely possible, that Joe Manchin can convince average people that, yes, he has the skill set and the past and the... Um, the work in the Congress to uh, be able to lead this nation in the way that a governor of a, a giant state could lead it. Um, so I, I don't see that as the same thing. Um, I also believe that Joe Biden is perfectly fine and will be there in November of 24. Bill? Yeah, I think I'm going to lead this into my issue when we go to the second segment. I'm on a uh, continuation of what we're talking about right now. I'm going to frame it somewhat differently when it comes to my segment. All right. Well, your segment is up next. Joe, as always, good uh, leadoff hitter and uh, 9 o'clock. Our panelists in studios, we welcome you back into the second hour of our Friday Five. We include John Gilstrap, New York Times bestselling author. Welcome back, Johnny. Good morning. Mr. Alonzo Perry, he's the uh, six-man award winner every year on this program. Mike Carl's partners meeting is the second uh, Friday of each month, so Alonzo is here in his stead when available. Alonzo. I should turn your microphone up. Alonzo. No, 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 don't go. Real, real respect comes when he turns on the mic. <laughs> Mr. Larry Schultz. Great to be here. Via telephone, Joseph Joey Tunts for ready. I see that Alonzo follows the uh, Mike Carl dress code, too. Very <laughs> Natalie dressed. Very Natalie attired. Yeah, very Natalie attired. And uh, the man who takes issue number two, the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield. Uh, good morning again, Rob. Uh, I'm going to pick up uh, where we left off, talking about uh, Joe Manchin uh, resigning uh, or not going to run for re-election and the possibility of be running as a uh, on a third-party candidate. Uh, I'm not going to rehash what we just talked about. I'm going to talk more about the potential impact. Uh, we've uh, we've been hearing quite a bit about a third-party candidate. Uh, and what is it going to do? Also, we saw recent polls. And let me per, uh, pick up on what Mike Carl would say. You cannot believe a poll. And there's some truth to that. There are so many inconsistencies and so much unknown about a poll. But it's the only thing that we have to really go on. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do now. The polls show that uh, in, in, I think, five out of six swing states, uh, Joe Biden is underwater compared to uh, Donald, uh, President Donald Trump. Uh, so, so that has to make the Democrats very nervous. Uh, can you believe the polls? We'll find out. But anyway, the Democrats are nervous. Alonzo made the comment earlier that he thought the DNC, the Democratic National Convention, was would be looking for someone to replace Joe Biden. I don't believe that they can do that. I think it's going to be Joe Biden's decision. If he wants to step aside, uh, he will. But until he does that, I do not think the DNC or anybody else going to put a meaningful candidate to run against him. 
Right now, there's no indication that Joe Biden will step aside, even though these polls suggest he should seriously consider it. But then that kind of leads me to the subject that I'd like to talk about, and that's the third-party candidates. Uh, we know historically that uh, uh, they have not been successful. Uh, the one that got the most was Ross Perot, I think, was 17 to 18 percent. Prior to that, it had been uh, Teddy Roosevelt, around 12 percent. So no one has really been successful. But the situations were different. Right now, we have two candidates, one on both the Republican side and one on the Democratic side, that are not very popular. Seventy percent of the country says they want an alternative. Right now, neither one of these candidates appear to be stepping aside. Uh, so the alternative is, the option is, would be a third-party candidate. Now, the Unity Party is not the only one that is suggesting a third-party candidate. FDR Jr. Uh, has said he's going to run as a third party. Uh, uh, Cornell West is running as a third party. Uh, again, I'm coming back to what the polls say. The polls suggest that uh, uh, FDR Jr., uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, RFK? RFK Jr., sorry, I got it on Roosevelt. RFK Jr. Uh, would actually hurt Trump a lot more than it would hurt Biden's reelection. Cornell West, if he draws any numbers at all, probably be the other way around. They say the Unity Party. Uh, the Unity Party folks say that they uh, they would affect bo- the, they would draw from both candidates equal to the same. A lot of folks don't think that's the case. If you have a race of 30, 35 percent for the two major parties, and then a third party, all they have to do is 30 or 35 percent, then they're very credible. My question is, is this a situation that a unity party, dependent upon the candidates, might be poised to actually win the election? All right. I want to go to uh, first telephone with Joe Ferretti. Joseph? Uh, The answer is no, Bill, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the, the way the Electoral College works is you got to win a state in terms of the popular vote. And while Ross Perot won 17, 18 percent, as you said, nationwide in terms of the popular vote, he won zero electoral votes. Uh, I think George Wallace was probably the last third party candidate who actually won a couple states. In uh, if my memory serves, he did. Yes, yeah, he won eight electoral votes. Yeah, yeah, in what sixty eight or sixty four? Um, sixty eight. So sixty eight. So I, I, you know, I just don't see it being viable. Uh, there's the barriers to entry. You know, getting on the ballots, number one, number two, then having the resources to win states in terms of popular votes. It's a very daunting task if you don't have a major party with all its fundraising uh, uh, abilities behind you. So it's uh, I don't see it as viable. I see third parties being nothing uh, but spoilers. Uh, and, and to add to your list, Bill, Marianne Williamson, uh, uh, the fruit fly at the picnic who won't go away, she, uh, she has announced she's going to be on the ballot for again. And recall that uh, there were some theories that she hurt Hillary Clinton in 16. So, uh, yeah, there's people they are going to be running. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it shakes out in terms of, of who they siphon votes from. But in terms of actually winning, I just don't see it happening. George Wallace in 68, by the way, won five states, the Deep South, basically, 46 electoral votes. On what party? 46. He was the American Independent Party. So he got 46. I did not realize that that high. Richard Nixon, 301. Humphrey, 191. George Wallace, 46. He picked up almost 10 million votes. Ross Perot had 19%, just under 19% of the vote in 1992. Now, moving along, Alonzo. I think that if George Washington uh, stuck his hands out of the dirt and climbed out of his grave and ran third party, he would lose. I mean, there is not a soul on... God's green earth right now that could win uh, a third party. People are are so afraid that that if they vote third party that they're wasting their vote, and that's not right. Um, and there's 
probably you know some some argument to be made about other type of voting systems that we've seen other countries have. That's I'm not in favor of it. I think that you know most uh, of the issues that we have today is from past reforms that you know we've tried to make to make things better. Um, I think this is what we got, and I just there has to be an actual uh, restructuring of individuals that want to change DC. And I don't think that there's a, a, a gut for that in either side right now at this moment. And so that that's why third parties are, are going to continue to fail. And so uh, that's how I feel about it. I mean, I have nothing more to add. Larry? They can certainly have the spoiler effect that you spoke about. Um, <clears throat> And a third party, Mr. Perot, pretty likely cost George W. Bush uh, the presidency, not by winning a state and getting electoral votes, but by deleting enough Republican votes that the Democrat won instead. And, 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 and those Ralph Nader did cost George W. B- I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, Al Gore. Al Gore the, yep. the election. And so there are at the margins uh, things that can happen. I believe the American people are smart enough that when people like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. show up with his sort of QAnon-driven um, um, past, they're going to examine that fairly closely, and there won't be very many people thinking, oh, you know, we'll get a chance now for RFK to finish of the great presidency that he was eventually going to uh, going to run. Uh, that just isn't so, and it's fairly obvious when you, if you can get to one of his press conferences. Uh, recently, I saw some video of a, an early press conference he had where they were holding up placards in front of his face while he was trying to talk. So he's got a long ways to go, and he's a lot different from his dad. Um, I just don't think there's anything here. Um, I, you know, I guess anything's possible with Joe Biden, but the idea that he'll turn around and walk away from this, especially after the successes that he's had uh, in in beating back inflation, in beating back the unemployment rate, um, some of those are historic. You know, the unemployment rate is lower than it was at any time since I was in grade school and i'm 65 years old that's a pretty big deal and is it going to hold all the way through next year i guess we'll see but joe biden is going to walk away i'd I'd be very shocked if he did john gilstrap the clinical term for rfk jr is nut job okay (laughs) it's 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 in the dsm um and Alonzo, I think there's 300 million people that are ready for change in Washington. That's that's the problem, and and we're saddled with the candidates that we're saddled with. The problem is, uh, Bill, I don't I don't think it's been said before. The numbers don't work. The the um, electoral college is just is just not friendly to to this process. So as it becomes spoilers, I think there's a cynical desire for third party candidates to drain off the votes they fear. From from the the right, they they want to drain votes away from Biden, and from the left, it's the other way around. Drain, drain votes away from whoever the Republican candidate turns out to be, probably Trump. Um, but in terms of having a meaningful impact, I don't know. But I do have a question. If anybody knows, it's not worth a lot of research. What happens if nobody, if we get three candidates and it, it, and it does split in thirds, and nobody gets two hundred and seventy? Do do we do another election? I I don't know what happens. We used to know the answer to this question because we dealt with it when the question was uh, bandied about with regards to two candidates and, and how that broke down. Okay. Uh, I think it goes to the House of Representatives. I believe it does yeah, go to the House, the House of Representatives. House of Representatives makes the decision. It's 11th okay. Amendment. Between three as opposed to between two. It's the 11th exactly. Amendment. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, now uh, that goes back to and, you then. Excuse me, and that's the sit-in House of Representatives. It's not the House of Representatives after the election. It's the current House of Representatives that would make that decision, I believe. Final thought goes to Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, I've heard all the arguments why a third candidate, something like the Unity Party, does not have a chance. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm skeptical. Uh, with this argument, I think if there's ever been an opportunity, ever been an opening in our nation's history, 
it is now because the unpopularity of these two. John made a very good point that the skeptical voters are looking for an alternative. Uh, I think you're going to see if there is a unity party. They're not committed yet. If there is a unity party and to put folks like Joe Manchin or Larry Hogan or some of these folks on the ticket, uh, there will be a lot of votes cast, and it will be more than just a spoiler. It very well may be enough to carry it to the House of Representatives. All right, for issue number three, we go to John Gilstrap. <clears throat> the, when Roe was overturned back in April, I think, um, there was a lot of, of dancing in the streets and, and particularly on, on the right side of the aisle because um, the decisions, whether or not uh, abortions are, are legal, was returned back to the individual states. And I thought that was, that, was, that was the victory right there. It was to bring such a momentous decision back to local control, let the state legislatures handle it. So now um, we, the Republicans are getting spanked across the board largely on the abortion issue. So if we stipulate, for the sake of argument, stay in your chair, for the sake of argument, we stipulate that all of the talking points are correct. Abortion is murder. It's, it's you know, all that, that whole drumbeat. Elections are about winning elections. Is it time for the Republicans, assuming that winning is important to them, to start talking about something else? And how do they do that? How do you come back from the ledge of mandatory um, abolishment of of abortions. And we have Republicans now who are celebrating the overturning of Roe, and now they want to have federal law that that says that the states can't have abortion. They want to reinstate Roe, which I, it baffles me, quite honestly. So the question really before the, before the tribunal here is, uh, can the Republicans, it's too late for Republicans to change their messaging on abortion, and is it something they even want to do? We can't even get Department of Defense people confirmed because of abortion, so <laughs> good luck. Alonzo Perry, you're up first. Uh, well, first I want to say that, you know, uh, abortion in that issue itself did uh, play a giant factor in what mobilized voters in these swing states, without a doubt. Um, that was the only thing that you saw Democrats run on. They had nothing else to offer. Um, they didn't run on anything related to crime. They can't talk about inflation. Wait, wait your turn, Bill. Wait your they turn, can't talk. They can't. 22 or 24? I mean, 22 or 23? I'm talking about 23. 23. Uh, 20, but it also 20. happened in 22. I mean, it did happen, yeah, okay. in 22 as well. But, I mean, at some point, they will actually run out of steam talking about abortion. I mean, people are going to be like o Ohio, for example. Uh, do you really think now that you're going to be able to mobilize those probably younger women that wanted to make sure that the constitutional right to abortion was uh, safeguarded for them to, you know, do it? The uh, Do you think you're going to get them back out at the polls to vote for Joe Biden in 24? It's not going to happen. They're losing the one chip that actually got people to the polls. So uh, I'm actually, you know, okay with the status quo. As for Republicans, we need to treat these issues as if it's a civil rights uh, uh, issue. And as far as I'm concerned, it is. Um, but we have to do it in, in the actual culture first. So what I'm telling every Republican uh, in every swing state that I know, have your school boards put abortion videos in the school curriculum, in sex ed. People need to see the practice. They need to see that it's barbaric. And it has to be from the ground up, grassroots change to make people want to have this issue discussed. It's a brand new issue. And the knee jerk reaction is that some type of freedom is being taken away. So that's galvanizing people, but that will not last long. And I'm hard pressed to say that in 24, people are going to be surprised in Virginia and Ohio and all these other states that have that issue on the ballot. All right, Bill, since you had some energy on this already, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll continue energy. Uh, Alonzo, I disagree with you that it's going to become a benign or transparent issue in 24, especially the fact that the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, is on record of doing just what John Gilstrap mentioned to do, to have the House of Representatives uh, to, uh, to say it would be a mandatory 
anti-abortion of federal law. Uh, now there's something like 40 congressmen on the Republican side that were elected from Purple District. They're absolutely petrified that this is going to become an issue before the 2024 election. Uh, it appears that Mike Johnson uh, will not make it as a, uh, will not put it on the floor to vote uh, in, in homage or in recognition of the delicate situation these 30 or 40 congressmen are. But from all indications in the back of the mind, there that is that could happen. If that does happen, then it's going to be Katie bar the door. It is going to become a political issue of not necessarily looking at the president, but certainly looking at the elected members of Congress. Larry, I do not think that women will forget for one minute, no matter how many years go by, that the Republican Party stepped in between them and their doctors and started making rules that they had to follow. That has resulted in some disastrous nightmares, mostly through poor legislative drafting uh, in states like Texas, where a woman um, senses that there's something wrong in the ninth month of her pregnancy, that in fact her, her, her baby to come is dying, and they can't find a doctor to relieve her from this, and she gets terribly ill from sepsis and has a spontaneous abortion, all of which health impacts could have been avoided without this law. Women are not going to forget it for themselves, for their daughters, or for their sisters. And therefore, while it may lower the temperature a little bit as states like Ohio pass this, they're not going to forget who did it and made him do that. Um, I think this is going to go on for quite some time. You have Donald Trump out there saying, I'm the guy just in the last two days, I'm the guy who got Roe v. Wade abolished. It's a campaign point for him that they took away uh, women's rights. You, you know, we men can sit around and bemoan it or talk about it any way we want, but when you talk to women... There's not a debate, not very much of one, and they don't want to hear it. <laughs> they do not want men saying, uh, we have the right to pass laws that will make your doctor wonder whether life-saving surgery is something he can do without losing his medical license. Part of the problem is it's way more complicated than anybody in the Republican Party seems to be willing to uh, say in terms of the treatments and the and the split offs as you go along uh, toward the ninth and uh, month, but beyond that, they they're asking the bigger question: Who in the heck ever told you it was your right to make these rules for me? You don't even understand what's going on here. Women understand this, but you don't find that many women at the helm of the anti-abortion movement. That's not true. There's some women, but not, it's being run by men. The laws are largely being written by men. And in some cases, the state laws especially wildly sim oversimplify the problem that is, that is human reproduction. Trump himself and, uh, stated that Republicans were going too far with complete uh, and total abortion bans yep. about a month ago. Indeed. So, Joe, we go to you on the phone. Yeah, well, uh, to, to John Gilstrap's question about, you know, what do the Republican Party needs to do about abortion messaging? I, I think the answer is pretty simple, and that is they have to conform to what the public uh, and the majority of the public wants, which is they don't want outright bans. They don't want doctors criminalized, as West Virginia considered doing. Uh, they want uh, abortion to be legal, safe, and rare. And rare meaning uh, probably first trimester, 15 to 20 weeks is often what you hear. Uh, statistically, just so we know, less than 1% of abortions uh, in, in states that allow uh, unfettered rights, uh, one, less than 1% are in the third trimester, and that's typically, as Larry indicated, for uh, health reasons involving the mother. Uh, and, and I can't let this comment go by without, without saying that uh, 
the prescription of having abortion videos played in a health ed class in school seems to be a non-starter. I mean, we just got through situations where parents were apoplectic about CRT and uh, being taught in the schools, but now we're going to have in, in a uh, sex ed class uh, a video about a medical procedure involving abortion. I, I can't imagine <laughs> that uh, you can square that that, uh, that circle. Uh, so bottom line is I think the messaging has to conform to what the public wants, and I think the Republicans have to realize that discussions about federal bans forcing the states to follow some federal law and and having very strict abortion laws is not what the public wants by and large. And and so the Republicans are going to have to figure out the messaging and, and, and really get in line with what even a majority of their own party has polled that they want, which is some – exceptions in some ways for women to deal with uh, the various issues that come up with the pregnancy, especially in the first trimester. Final thought goes back to you, Billy. I believe it's me. Oh, me, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Um I think this, the, the issue, I agree with you, Joe, actually, in this, that the let me address some of the earlier stuff. Roe v. Wade, was, when if Donald Trump or anybody else it, it, did stipulate that he said this, that I'm responsible for overturning Roe. Overturning Roe does not legalize abortion, it, or it does, it does not eliminate the right for women to, to get abortions. What Roe did was get in the way of states being able to self-determine whether or not abortions were legal in their states. So there's been a, a misrepresentation, deliberate, because it's easy, of, of what the decision really was. And I think the attention span of modern voters is, is part of the problem because this is a nuanced issue. There are certainly circumstances um, where the the um, a miscarriage is called a spontaneous abortion, right? So there are there are clearly issues where life of the mother and what have you that are worthy of debate, and I, I where I would come down on the issue is, is irrelevant. The problem is we're not having the honest discussion. What we're doing is is the hardcore, all abortion is murder, or um, all restrictions on abortion is is interfering with women's rights. Well, you know, get get lost in that is the discussion of this little human being with fingers and a heartbeat protecting those rights as well. Again, that's not the issue I want to litigate here. But unless and until we have the patience and the wherewithal to have an honest, nuanced discussion. If Republicans want to win, they need to either stop talking about it or certainly be less draconian. At the federal level, I urge anybody, any Republican in Washington, to, to have a national ban on abortion, whether it's permanent, you know, across the border for 15 weeks or whatever it is. Tim Scott, I think, just torpedoed his career from, uh, with the 15-week the thing in the, in the debate. Um, that's just reinstatement of Roe. That's taking away states' rights to make their own decision. I, that's if it's if it's wrong from the the, the judiciary, it's wrong it's wrong from the um, the legislature as well. So the Republicans need. I don't think this issue is going to go away. I think if only because the Democrats don't need another issue. This is a big deal after fifty years of of being taught indoctrinated that abortion is a right it has become uh it, it's become a women's rights issue whether it is or not that's how it's how it's perpetu uh, perpetuated and the republicans need to either stop talking about it or find a different way to message All right. now we move on to issue number four and for that we go to larry schultz Yes, uh, I debated quite a bit about which of these to raise. Has there ever been a Supreme Court decision which blew up in the face of the party which appointed the justices like Dobbs has? Uh, the only one I can think of, and I'll throw this out, is Dred Scott. <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember that one. <laughs> well, I do. That... <laughs> they had this thing called Dobbs. reading, John. <laughs> it allows you to go back. Dem what was Democrats, that, Alonzo? I said Democrats did a really bad job with that one. I mean, it just absolutely blew up in their faces. So Yeah. You know. Well, there, there's the question. Let's go to Joe Ferretti first. Joe. Well, I, I have to agree, Larry, that uh, <laughs> probably 
Uh, since the Dred Scott decision, there has not been a Supreme Court decision that has blown up in a political party's face like uh, like Dobbs. Uh, and it remains to be seen, as we discussed in the last segment, whether the Republicans can develop the right kind of messaging that they'll need to deal with that. Um, I, I think what Donald Trump is doing is so instructive here. I, I hate to turn to him as any kind of example, but uh, he is, as Rob mentioned, he is just outright telling any Republican who will listen that you can't be discussing federal bans. You can't have, as he called it, draconian. I don't even know if he knows what the word means, but draconian uh, restrictions regarding uh, abortion issues. You, you, you can't go down that path because that's not where the general public is. Uh, poll after poll, including polling in our own state of West Virginia, shows that a majority of folks uh, are not for these strictest limitations that are often discussed on the right. And so uh, th- th- they have to develop some messaging that really conforms to where the public is. And I think you, you can look at that in a, in a lot of ways. And the Democrats for years fought that that battle and lost in many ways. Remember, it was LBJ who, who famously said that he, the South had been lost to the Democrats uh, in the future because of the civil rights acts that were passed, uh, not by the Supreme Court, but by Congress. And of course, eventually the Supreme Court comes around to upholding many of those laws. Uh, and that, in, in LBJ's mind, cost the Democratic Party the South, probably for generations to come. So the impacts are there. Uh, We see it in uh, red states like Kansas and Kentucky and now Ohio. Uh, So, yeah, this is a a watershed moment for uh, the Republicans, at least with this issue. And uh, they they continue to grapple with it. And I don't see an answer yet being developed by them. Mr. Gilstrap, I object to the form of the question. I I don't... um, I don't think that this blew up. I think this is being blown into, or expanded into, uh, the, the, the Dobbs decision is being expanded into something that it, it's not and was never intended to be. Roe was a, was a state's rights issue, and that's the decision that has, has been decided. There's no blowing up on anything. It's the misrepresentation of it on both sides. I don't think most people understand, you know, actually read this stuff, but... Um, it's certainly deliberately misrepresented by the left as Republicans are taking away your your right to kill babies, your your right to abortion. That's that's not what the decision was. It is what the decision is in the political debate in the various states now that it's going to the legislature. OK, that's fine. But I think the lesson that comes out of this is that the left's knee jerk reaction to talk about stacking the courts and let's terrorize the justices' house. Let's make sure that their neighborhood gets no rest by banging things. And then let's let's make sure that we don't protect the justices by getting rid of the protesters in, in, in front of their houses. That that near violent overreaction to the Dobbs decision proves to be exactly the wrong thing. The left, as everyone, should be celebrating the return of a decision to states' rights. Now we live with the consequences. And you know what? Sometimes it's like these people who want to have the um, uh, delegate, what is it, the, uh, the Constitutional Convention of the states, because everybody thinks the, left, the, the right thinks that we're going to have you know, more permissive gun legislation and all of this. Once you allow the people to speak... Sometimes you're surprised by what they say. And I think that's what's happening with Roe, but I don't think it blew up. I think that the Dobbs decision actually created great opportunities for Americans to speak. Billy. Yeah, clarification first. Uh, If it should go to the uh, Supreme Court, excuse me, I'm sorry, to the House of Representatives to determine who won the presidential election, it is the new House of Representatives. It's not the existing House of Representatives. Uh, Going back to the uh, Tulare's question, uh, and it's... Perception. If you ask a hundred people, uh, what did they uh, overturn a row weight? What did it mean? Probably ninety-five percent would say it meant 
the abortion issue. They do not recognize the state's rights. And then to make this even worse, and it was alluded to earlier, that if the current House of Representatives does try to put a bill through saying it's, uh, it is a federal law uh, for abortion, limit to abortion, then that's going to just reinforce this perception that it's state's rights. The other thing is that I, what I found a bit of interest every time, without exception, it is the abortion has gone before the public, the right for abortion has overwhelmingly won. It's those states such as West Virginia, which it has not gone to the public, it is done through our elected representatives, and they're taking the position that abortion is, uh, uh, is illegal. But if it goes to the, to the voters, it's a different story. Mm-hmm. Alonzo. Well, I just think that You know, like I said before, there was a lot of people that, you know, eat avocado toast, drink pumpkin spice lattes, and (laughs) never have ever looked at anything political in their life except for, you know, what's on their Tumblr, Twitter, or whatever other, you know, um, as Jason Barrett would call them, ego apps. And they went into the polls, galvanized, you know, uh, to to sit there and, and to vote on that one issue. And then they went and voted blue down the ticket for the rest of it. And the, the, the really important thing here though on this topic i feel like is getting down to it's not so much i guess about the actual structure of the case in itself that it was you know a states rights case i don't think that that's the 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 issue here i think that fundamentally america right now is in a form of spiritual peril and they they, they look at this issue as there was a freedom taken away from them, and they just want abortion to be legal. And so I, I think the real question here is what should Republicans do about it? And Trump, it, it, you know, even though I don't agree with him, is kind of right. He's kind of danced around the question. He's got to a place where he's like, you know, 15 weeks is a, a, a rational thing. I don't know if I'll see it. I'll think about it or whatever and let – the 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 actual culture uh aspect of this win the debate first before we start to move on legislation for it and i know that that makes some of the people that are more conservative upset they say you know like i'm a single issue voter and i want it all today that's not how democrats operate that's not how we need to operate we need to operate like they do move the football one step at a time until we can get a national consensus on something reasonable because just having it uh, undealt with even at a national level is just irrational and it's not fair and I think that it's it's pretty bad for the country let me just state that I think the avocado gets a bad rap (laughs) it's a very healthy I think it's a fruit Uh, it's got it's got many good ingredients in it that help your skin they make me gag I cannot eat an avocado we're supposed to take the nut out first Not choke. Not choke. <laughs> you said gag. I maybe you don't know how to eat them properly. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I love, I love avocados. <laughs> well, that's yeah. good. See, Alonzo, there's middle ground there. All right, final, uh, final thought goes back to you, Larry. Yes. Two states, Kansas and Ohio, will be written down in the history books uh, regarding this issue. Kansas, out of the blue, uh, no reason to think anybody there would do this. Uh, propose a constitutional amendment to their state constitution, uh, protecting the right to abortion, and it overwhelmingly passed. They were afraid in Ohio that when they tried the same thing, it was going to pass. And so they put up a thing last summer, I guess it was, uh, a, a few months ago, that would raise the re- the level Uh, of the vote required to amend their state constitution that was seen for what it was which was a trick to end run the system and it was defeated badly and then the other day uh it it turns out that um the voters of the state of ohio by 57 to uh 43 um amended their constitution as well and so those are two states that I didn't ever look to for activism on that level. Um, You look at Virginia, and the governor of Virginia, uh, Yonkin, had had, uh, endorsed this 15-week supposedly more reasonable ban um, and said, you know, this is kind of the way to go. And 
They didn't do him any good either. Uh, he's now fighting a completely Democratic House and Senate. Even though the issue wasn't on the ballot, he talked about it enough that it, it affected the way people voted uh, in the House and Senate races. Almost all the ads for that election were about abortion bans or women's rights and women's health. Uh, when you watch the TV commercials, we, we're running out of time, so I got to get to Alonzo now for issue number five before Alonzo doesn't get an issue in today. Alonzo. Well, I want to get out of the the abortion. Thank you. Phase. Thank you. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> nothing um, I enjoy more than five men sitting around talking about abortion. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Democrats are fracturing along the lines of their support for Israel or for the Palestinians in this kind of conf- or conflict right now. Uh, so, should Biden? not be the nominee will this be the line of contention for the next democratic presidential candidate i kind of like how you're in the mike carl seat and you kind of picked up where mike would have gone with this except mike would have said is mike is joe biden the worst president ever (laughs) you you toned it down just a gear and i I appreciate that so uh joe ferretti you're first we've got about a minute a piece for you guys on this one Okay, well, I, uh, Alonzo, I think you might be wish-casting a little bit here. I, I don't know about the fractures that you're uh, referring to with the Democratic Party. I think uh, uh, what the Biden administration seems to be doing is prevailing upon Israel to, uh, uh, and I think this is kind of crazy, but they prevailed upon them to have some sort of uh, lull in the, in the fighting to allow for the refugees to get the heck out of harm's way, and, and that seems to be happening. Israel announced the uh, a four-hour cessation of hostilities uh, every day to allow for the safe passage of, of uh, refugees. So uh, I, I don't know how you can stop a war for four hours, but uh, that, I think Israel is just window dressing there. But uh, the bottom line is uh, I think the Biden administration is behind Israel in their quest to eliminate Hamas, and I don't think that's going to waver. John Gilstrap. I think a four-hour break is a wonderful opportunity for the Palestinians to move their munitions to someplace else for, for better launching. Um, I, I, I don't think this is the kind of issue. Americans don't focus all that much on, on foreign policy. I think it's a big issue for the Jewish community. I think it's a big issue for the uh, Arab community, Palestinian community. But for the average person in, in Kansas City or, for that matter, in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, I don't think it matters that much. Billy? Yeah, and except for one or two very vocal uh, pro-Palestinians in Congress, I do not see it fraction along a fraction of the Democratic Party. Uh, The Democratic Party, like the nation as a whole, has supported Israel, and I think they'll continue to do so. Lawrence? I I tend to agree with Bill that this has uh, caused some ripples across the Ivy League campuses. Uh, There's been a, a lot of talk about well, wait a minute, if it's wrong to do a certain thing to one group of people, isn't it equally wrong to do the same thing to somebody else? Um, and th- there's uh, a lot of equivocating about this. I don't think in the end that by supporting Israel, uh, the Biden administration is running some giant political risk. Uh, I think they're doing what the American people, if we were given a, a play beside to vote on it what we would pick um a sort of tone it down boys let's uh take a break every once in a while let's see if we can get some folks to safety and uh you know you can go on but we're not going to go on forever at this uh the the united states is not going to support uh a full-blown war over there i don't believe alonzo High information Democrats are physically transforming. I mean, you have staffers that are, you know, on pro Palestine uh, protests in front of D.C. or you know, in front of the Capitol and stuff. You have uh, uh, Ivy League schools. You have uh, regular colleges. You have Shepherd University. Just you know, uh, outside of Shepherd University, a group with a, a pro Palestine parade where they were shouting to the river to the sea you know uh, so it, it's 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 all politics are local and i think that everyone at this table understands that so uh, we have to understand that there is a group of of democratic voters right now that are calling him genocide joe and you have another group that may be in c- congress right now that can avoid the pro- the the question but it's fracturing right across those lines 
It used to be a struggling president needed a war to help boost his numbers to get reelected. If you're running out of your first term here, this uh, this doesn't seem to be working in Joe's favor here. Alonso. No, not at all. <laughs> you know, Bill, you're shaking your head. Yes. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Yeah. Usually, you need a war of your own. I think. Yeah. Is, that involves the United States yeah, directly, right? Somehow, yeah. and this one doesn't. Well, we are launching missiles oh. into Syria. Oh, I also no think question about that. There's less of a thirst for war too. I think with my generation and some of the younger kids, I, I think that we're you know we kind of see the foreign policy establishment you know uh, kind of running us through this like grinder every 20 years in American history, and mm-hmm. I think that now people are just kind of like, is this really like why? Why do we need to go to war all the time? You know, why Why do we have to, why is this our fight? You know, and uh, I, I feel that way, you know, uh, about a lot of these uh, issues. There were an awful lot of people who felt that way back in 2006, and that didn't stop anything. Um, we, 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 weren't, we weren't shepherding or refereeing a war between two other countries. We went to war with Iran and, and uh, to, with Iraq, but, with Afghanistan. But that's and where it, Trump came from. It paid us nothing. Um, it, it, it gave us nothing. We lost the political will. Yeah. We can beat anybody if we really want to beat them. Sure. But yeah. the question is, what are we doing over there? Yeah. <laughs> and we never really answered that question. We just sort of said, okay, let's go. And then, uh-oh, this is dangerous. Uh-huh. Final thoughts. We start with Joe Ferretti via telephone. Joe, go. The highest form of public service is military service. Lawrence. Be nice to your children. They will pick your nursing home. (laughs) They might pick yours. (laughs) Hats off to the Musman uh, ladies volleyball team. They did well. They fit in the finals yesterday. Mr. Perry. God bless the troops and vets. Let's go get some free food today. Mr. Gilstrap. (laughs) Thanks to all the veterans and also to their families for the sacrifices they make. Hey, it is uh, 10 o'clock. Dave Ramsey shows next. This is Talk Radio, WNR Martinsburg and TV 10. And we'll talk to you again in 70 short hours. Have a great Veterans Day. Yeah.